Today I'm going to talk about uh, some disk encryption. Um, I'm going to go over a couple of different implementations and make fun of some big companies and uh, talk about some personal experiences that friends of mine and acquaintances have had. And um, So anyway, I'm Jacob Applebaum. I'm some guy with great hair from San Francisco. You should come visit us. We'll treat you like a criminal um, if you're interested. So this is going to uh, talk about some legal issues, though I should disclaim that I'm not a lawyer. Um, you should check with your local EFF chapter, um, if you have one. Some of you do. Um, so I've, I've also come up with a system that I'm going to discuss a little bit later, which is mostly a proof of concept. I, it, it, it's an idea that, that might work out, but it might not work out. And I'd like to hear your comments after the talk on it, because I know that it's totally crappy and has a bunch of problems. And you guys are just the people I want to rip it apart and tell me why I suck. So with that said, <coughs> disencryption is generally, it's generally something you would use when you have a threat model where you have a laptop or a mobile device. Uh, yesterday, the Linux, uh, the Linux based phone, they were talking about using DMCrypt to protect your, uh, your personal contact lists. Um, I think that's really a great idea because pretty much everybody here has a cell phone or some sort of mobile device that has all sorts of personal information, like everything from their whereabouts on their calendars uh, to contacts that probably wouldn't want their, their phone numbers leaked, like uh, you all might remember the Paris Hilton hack. So not that, that would, this, this crypto wouldn't have protected against that because of the way that they stored the data, but if she had been more crafty, she might have been able to keep her data on her phone and safe, even if someone were to come and rob her. Um, we also want to talk about servers. So let's say you run a shell server, and you have users that might be doing things that you don't like, but you can't stop them. And let's say that the police come to your door, and they kick it down, and they seize your server. If it's set up in such a way that when they log in, it mounts their home directory, and it's actually an encrypted container, then when that user has to give up their key in a court of law, they're not going to have every other user's data at the same time so that the police on their fishing, fishing expedition can get everybody in one big sweep. So the problem with shell servers is uh, especially like if, if you, you see like an activist shell server community or something like this, it's like it's one server to own them all, which is it's a really bad single point of failure for entire communities. So if you're building servers like that, it could be advantageous for you to have uh, per user home directories that are encrypted, but there are some flaws with just password based encryption and, and I'll get into that in a little bit. So another one of our uh, issues in our threat model is that you live in a free country. So you need to figure out if that's actually the case because you probably don't. I know that I don't, um, but it depends on the circumstance in which I'm put in front of uh, a judge. Uh, so in criminal court, I have the right to remain silent and not incriminate myself in the United States. Um, in civil court in the United States, I don't have that right. Um, there are lots of cases that have recently happened where people have uh, either lost their data and thus did not have to give up their passphrases or their data was compromised through a forensic lab exploiting implementation vulnerabilities or they had to give up their passphrase because they were in civil court in the United States. And if they didn't, they could be locked away basically forever for not complying with the judge's order. So it's, it's great to have all of this really strong cryptography, um, but it, it sucks because you um, basically have to sell yourself out and up the river as a result. So if you have the right to remain silent, which is one of the most fundamental freedoms in a free country, in my opinion, then there are some really interesting things that you can do with this cryptography, like uh, not give up your key. So if the implementation is strong, they're not going to get your data. So you have to figure out if you, if you live in this country, um, this, this supposed free country. Uh, the UK is not one of these countries. The United States is not one of these countries. I've been told recently by some people here in Germany that Germany is one of those countries, and I'm very envious of you if that's the case. So if you have other threats, such as a maid who's cleaning your house and imaging your drive every day to look at differences, you, uh, you have some other problems. And most disk cryptography is not going to save you from this because they're going to see which sectors on your disk have changed. And they're going to know through plain text attacks and through, through all sorts of different methods that you're modifying data 
what parts of the drive you're modifying data on, and they could probably figure out, well, he's just created a new file system, or he's been writing lots of log files because he happens to have his, his drive partitioned in such a way that this is clearly his var log partition, and this is clearly his home partition, and so you have to be careful about uh, that. You also have to be careful about keystroke loggers. It's like, it's like a lot of work for nothing. <laughs> so physical security, but again, if your physical security isn't up to par before your disk is stolen, you could be monitored. The uh, various different governments around the world like to do really uh, long sting operations, like putting people in to like hacker communities or other supposed like cyber terrorist communities or whatever you want to say they're called, and, and trying to get people compromised before this disk cryptography would actually get in their way. Last night I was told a, a pretty funny story, which I can't totally repeat, but basically, big, you know, multi-month sting operation, and they accidentally sent in um, some black and white cops, just, you know, they don't know anything about computers, and after this long sting operation, the cops said, oh, which computers do you need? Oh, these ones over here? Okay, and they just unplugged them. So really long sting operation, and then they screwed it up, because when you power the machines off, this actually is a pretty safe way to deal with it. So apparently that officer went home crying, the lead officer. And that's what I like to see, crying police officers. So, again, I'm not a lawyer, so you should consult one. I'm sure I'm advising you on many things that you shouldn't do, um, and probably saying things that are not, not so nice. So, in the United Kingdom, we have the RIP Act, which is really bad news if you live there. Um, I know people who specifically do not use cryptography anymore because of the RIP Act. They don't want to send encrypted email because they're afraid that, for example, GPG doesn't have perfect forward secrecy. If you can compromise the key at any point down, uh, down the line, you're totally going to own all of their messages that they've ever sent. Even if they're doing lots of fun stuff like revoking keys, if they can just image your key once and they can coerce you into giving the password or you're going to spend a lot of time in jail. Of course, it's a security trade-off because maybe the data is worth spending time in jail because two years might be better than 10 years, but it still really sucks because you don't have the right to remain silent. However, part three of the act is the one that actually requires you to give up your keys. And apparently it's not in effect yet, but I find that hard to believe that people would not uh, give up their keys when threatened with this jail time because they could be the very first case of part three because it would only, as far as I understand it, it would only require a magistrate to authorize part three to be brought into effect and then you could be the first test case of this. So you probably don't want to be the first test case of this and I, I, the system I designed that I'll talk about a little bit later, um, I basically did it because I don't like the British government. So I was inspired. So <clears throat> what we can learn from the UK is that this is where we're headed as a society if we don't really uh, value a lot, of, uh, a lot of our freedoms and our privacy and our right to remain silent. So we can, we can also see what we shouldn't do and what it actually prevents in society and how crypto systems will be modified so that we don't have to, I don't know, give up our keys, for example, even when we legally have to or we go to jail. So in the USA, we have the Fifth Amendment, which basically the most important part of it says you will not be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against yourself. So this means that when you're asked for your passphrase, uh, you don't have to give it up in theory. Um, now there have been a couple of interesting cases. When Adrian Lama was busted for hacking the New York Times, his backpack with his laptop apparently had fallen off of a bridge and into a river and floated away. So he solved having to give up his passphrases by not having any data around as evidence against him. This is probably your best bet because if you can accidentally drop your laptop into a river and have it float away and no one ever sees it again, they're not going to be able to coerce you to give up their passphrase regardless of the law and the burden of proof in theory is on them to prove that you're guilty and hopefully that's actually the case and you don't have to prove that you're innocent against some really heinous charges because you'd be in well, your laptop would be up the river. So, in civil cases, this is not the case uh, in the United States. You have to give up your passphrase. So, recently there was uh, a high profile case, who shall go unnamed in the United States, where the person was basically sued in criminal court as well as in civil court, and 
what ended up happening with him was that in the criminal court, he didn't have to give up his keys, and in the civil court, he basically has to give up his keys. So by trying him twice, which in theory is, is, is legitimate, he has to compromise his, his crypto. Luckily for him, he was using a vulnerable crypto implementation and uh, the forensics labs that examined his disks exploited him before he had to sell himself out. So, no big deal. But it still sucks that that's the case. So, the civil cases in the United States are much like what the RIP Act will be in the UK. And so as a result, we need to have solutions for these types of law problems, if, if you could call them that. So in Germany, as I said, um, I've been told that it's safe from coercion, but I wasn't told this by a lawyer, I was told this by some Debian developers, and I was told this by some friends of mine and just random people I talked to. If anyone here could correct me on that, I would be very happy with it. Um, be really nice, so thanks in advance. So, what's important in an implementation? Well, we want encryption containers such as a file or perhaps data that's written directly to a device. This could be a partition, slice, whatever. So one thing that's really important is that they should be file system independent. So you should have native devices for these like normal file systems. You should be able to put RiserFS or UFS or whatever you want onto this device. It should act transparently. You, when you read and write data from it, it should work perfectly. You, so reasonable passwords, you need to have a reasonable password, and you need to make sure that they're transformed. For example, there's an implementation that, well, it takes your password and it may or may not transform it. It also discloses it in a non-transformed method, which means that you can recover everything. So that's not such a good idea. <clears throat> or you should discard it. You should make it so that you have real key abstraction. So if your password is, I don't like cops looking at my data, it should not have anything to do with the actual decryption key for your drive. It should only be used in order to unlock other things that actually have truly random keys. So this is important and lots of people get that wrong and that's not so good because we as users are always going to be the weakest link, especially in disk cryptography. So another thing is password salting and iteration because Basically, if every single person makes a file system, um, say ext2 file system on this device, if your password is insulted or iterated through, say, AES-128 a thousand times, then you're going to have the same file system uh, right at the beginning for all the same passwords, which means rainbow tables, and that means that you could say if you wanted to, build up a very large uh, database of all of the beginning sectors and find out what the passphrase is. And then it would be as simple as just doing a binary lookup and figuring out what passphrase they were using. So <clears throat> amazing that that's actually possible and that people didn't think about that, but that it's actually the case. And another thing is that without key abstraction, you have a really hard time changing your data. And it means that if someone can shoulder surf your passphrase, you're screwed, totally. Um, because what ends up happening is you type in your passphrase and they shoulder surf it, but say they haven't imaged the drive yet. You can't change your passphrase without having re-encrypted all your data on the drive. And that's a terrible, terrible thing. So assuming that they have imaged your drive, you're already, you're just in a world of trouble. If you have the ability to say use a GPG key and a key file and your GPG key is on a USB disk and your, your uh, hard drive is encrypted, then what that allows for is for you to essentially have them image your drive and what you know, if they see from a camera or someone shoulder surfing, what they know is actually just something totally unrelated to the, the disk and you can change your GPG passphrase. And if, if you re-encrypt your GPG key, you change your passphrase right there on the spot, Shoulder serving your password really gains them nothing unless they've already imaged your GPG key. So if you can take your key away from your data and have this abstraction, then you can have an added layer of security and you raise the bar. So that's really important in an implementation. And a lot of the like first and second generations of disk cryptography don't, don't do that. And that's really bad as well. Especially when you compare it with all these other important things. And there are, there are other important things. So for example, Encrypting your swap partitions files, paging files, yeah, wow, that's really important. That's probably 
one of the most important things um, because especially if you get everything else wrong, like you don't transform the passwords correctly and you just end up with the plain text password floating around in memory as your key, it's like look at the data structures in memory, find out where the key should be, extract the key from memory, or if it happens to be written to the disk, well, I'll show you later. So it's also really nice if you have your choice in symmetric ciphers. So let's say that AES was broken tomorrow, it would be really crappy if you had to switch operating systems entirely just to use a different cipher. So it's important that you have a modular system, something that allows for you to have AES or Blowfish or the Super Elite Triple Desk <coughs> or XOR or what, whatever you want. But the idea is that it's not designed around one system that if it's broken or one hashing algorithm that if that's broken, say MD5, then you're screwed. So you don't want that. You want to try and find things that are modular and they think ahead and they think you want choices and they try to design things with failure in mind because ultimately this is all about failure. Someone's going to get your data and you have to protect it. Another thing is multiple key support, which is important. So let's say, again, that you have a assaulted, iterated passphrase and you have the first sector of your disk and everybody knows what's in the first sector of the disk because you made a file system and it's the same file system and it can be reproduced. Well, if you have multiple keys, one per sector or two per sector or something like this, that allows for you to have the very beginning of your disk cracked and it doesn't get them anything, which is also really important because you don't want them to get your data. Um, Peter Goodman wrote a really cool paper um, about mem uh, retrieving things from memory, like, um, if you leave data structures in memory for long periods of time, then you oxidize the DRAM cells in memory and they can figure out, apparently, like using some pretty uh, amazing equipment, they can figure out um, what exactly your key was, even by powering off the RAM chip. Um, so maybe your implementation flips bits in memory. Um, there are implementations that do this and that's pretty cool. So it's important to, again, transform your keys or destroy them. So um, generic dictionary attacks, we want to we wanna basically rule those out. We shouldn't have the ability to do a dictionary attack against this. Your passphrase should not be tied together. So all right, what's nice? In today's world, wouldn't it be nice to have deniable decryption? So you could say with the rubber, rubber hose FS, oh, officer, my passphrase is X, Y, Z. Well, that would be really nice, possibly, and we'll get to that. Uh, the system that I, that I came up with is a framework called MADE, and I'll get to this soon. Um, so a, a funny thing happened to me just now when I was in the cafeteria area. Um, there was a guy who was probably in the audience, um, seemed like a smart guy, very conscious of the fact that using disk crypto is important, and he's like, yeah, I encrypt slash home. Well, that's great, except that you generate log files, and you open documents that get written to temp, so your super secret document that's totally safe on your home partition gets written into temp, or you open it in VI and it gets written to var temp, and it, after reboot or shutdown, it's still there, and your password list of all the boxes you've owned is uh, now incriminating you, and you're in, you know, you're up the creek again. Or say you've got a document, um, you're printing out subversive information, and you don't want anybody to know anything about it, but let's say they use the uh, little yellow printer dots that the EFF has recently discovered and they track it back to your house and you say, no, no, that wasn't mine, I didn't print that. They seize your computer and they look at your printer spool and oh, whoops, yes it was and you just lied to an officer. <laughs> so you want to make sure that you actually encrypt either everything or you are very careful about where your user can write to and you're very careful about where you can leak information because you're probably leaking information like a sieve. And the other thing is that you want to be fast, which there are some fast implementations and there are some dog slow implementations. So don't use the dog slow ones unless you think the security trade off is worth it. So here are the people that try to solve this. Um, I, I want to say that even though I'm going to say not so nice things about some of these people, with the exception of Apple Computer, I think everybody here did a fine job attempting at what they've done. Apple Computer stands alone in their shame. So we'll talk about all of these. OpenBSD, NetBSD, FreeBSD, CryptoLoop, DMCrypt, uh, DMCrypt Loop AES, and File Fault, uh, as well as um, a couple of others. I'm not going to talk really so much about PGP disk or encrypt 
or um, some of these other solutions. Um, if, you, if you feel the need to use PGP disk or, or um, some of these other solutions, you can evaluate it using some of the guidelines I've talked about, but I personally am not interested in using non-free operating systems when I have data security in mind because, well, offline security is really important. It's pretty embarrassing that when you mount up your encrypted partition and your box gets owned and they get your data that way because this is, a, again, just a protection against offline attacks. So to turn it on and you get owned, it doesn't matter how strong your crypto is on your disk. So, all right. So who pretends to solve it and actually screws you? Well, that's just about everybody. But again, I have to emphasize this. Apple really fucks up really badly. They are stupid. <clears throat> so OpenBSD has some, some good things about it. They allow you to encrypt the swap. And they've done this for quite some time. And they do a pretty good job of it. They generate random keys on boot. This is nice. This is really good. Because even if you don't have an encrypted file system, there are things in memory that you do not want written to the disk. So this is nice because you won't leak information that way. This is just, that's really important, especially when you start using encrypted file systems, because if you don't have encrypted swap and you swap out your keys for your encrypted file system, well, you yeah, you're done. Um, so vnconfig is a nice little program, but it's not very modular or extensible. They designed it with Blowfish Cypher only, which is not bad, right? Blowfish is not a bad cipher. So, Again, though, if there was a problem with Blowfish, <coughs> you would probably not be uh, very happy with that. So hopefully, at some point, this will be extended. If there are any OpenBSD developers in the house, I, I think you guys totally rock, and you could do a better job. Um, you're not doing a bad job, per se, but um, it depends on the work of other people that you base your work on, right? So Blowfish, if it were ever to have problems, OpenBSD would have issues, too. So another problem is that it's interactive entry of password. Uh, I read a patch not too long ago that allowed you to read it from a file, but that's not so great. It doesn't really tie in very well. So like you have this encrypted key file somewhere, which could be totally random, but it's just an encrypted, it's uh, just a plain text uh, key in a file, which is not necessarily the best choice. Uh, when I talked about loop AES in a little bit, they, they tie this together with other things. So you have a passphrase to protect the file, and the only time it's ever decrypted is when it's actually in memory. And that's a little bit more elegant, but it's, none of these things are perfect. They're all pretty much dirty hacks. So it doesn't, as a result, it doesn't really have usable key abstraction, and it doesn't really have multiple key modes, and it doesn't really have your choice of, so, uh, of ciphers. But it's cool because it's, uh, it's floss, it's free Libra, open source software, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so it'll be improved, and that's great. Um, it's also nice that it's open because that means people were able to see that these are the limitations of it, and there's open discussion about it, and there's no questions about it. it there's room for improvement, but it's a pretty good job overall. NetBSD is fucking awesome. Thank you, NetBSD. You guys rock. The people that wrote this are really smart. They're so sharp. They thought of, well, they looked at all the people who had screwed up before, and they fixed those problems. <coughs> And if I was going to use um, any implementation of disk crypto myself, and I ran NetBSD, this would be the one, for sure. Um, if you're running Linux, of course, this isn't really your, your solution. And as far as I understand it, this has been ported uh, to OpenBSD, but for some reason it wasn't actually included properly uh, in the actual releases. I don't know why. So you OpenBSD, NetBSD developers should get together, hold hands, share the love. <coughs> so. It's really great. It's totally flexible. You have your choice of ciphers. You have sector by sector and encryption. You have password transformation with a, an open standard, which allows for salted iteration, iterated hashing. You have n-factor authentication possible. You have keys in a file. And again, they really know what they're doing. This is a really good implementation. And I like it a lot. So. FreeBSD has the geome-based disk encryption, GBDE. There was a talk about it yesterday, and there's a paper published in, uh, in the little booklet that comes with, yeah, that was yours? Okay, excellent. So it's pretty good. Um, it's written by a really, small, uh, really smart fellow. Um, although I've read some interesting critiques of it on the cryptography list, the Metstyled list, um, which basically says it's like, it's great, but it's overly complex, um, which, that's not necessarily the best thing when you have uh, security issues in mind. You probably want to reduce the complexity. So um, one of the comments that was on that list is that it, it doesn't seem broken 
totally outright. I, I don't see anything entirely obviously wrong with it, but it is quite complicated. Um, an example of this is you have a passphrase and a lock file, right? So this, uh, this, this concept of a lock file is interesting. It allows you to have two factors if you split them correctly. So you could have your lock file in a file or you could have this like um, number of bits. Uh, you could have it in the beginning of a disk partition or whatever. But you can't decrypt it without having both. So that's kind of nice, but also kind of strange, I guess. I don't, I don't really see the benefit to doing it that way. I think that there are probably more elegant solutions, but it seems to work, and so I've not heard of anybody breaking it, unlike other disk implementations that I'll get to. So it meets most of our requirements, but it has some issues, which is that, uh, as far as I could tell, there wasn't a really easy way to use a key file, and you have to use a passphrase, which means, again, you have this issue with the user and the passphrase. It's nice, though, because you can change your passphrase. They didn't, they didn't design it as poorly as some of the Linux implementations that are just totally stupid brain-dead implementations. Um, but it has issues with uh, mounting the root file system because, again, if, you, if you're trying to make sure you don't leak data, and this, this is really important, you want to be able to have your root file system mounted and everything underneath it encrypted. You want to have your binaries encrypted. You want to have your temp space encrypted, your log files encrypted, your home directory encrypted. But then you have some other issues, which is that it's not per user. So root can own you pretty easily in any of these implementations but any other user might be able to because you just have Unix permissions to save you. Um, and I didn't see anybody implement this yet, but it's probably possible to set it up so that every user when they log in would be able to have their own home directory um, set up in a certain way so that it's encrypted on a per user, per password basis, um, which again would be nice if you're running a shell server. I'm, I'm sure it's possible, I've just not heard of anybody doing it, but that's an issue that you would want to take a look at if you're going to implement something like this. Um, I'm not actually sure how to pronounce this. I think it's Jelly, but um, that sounds like an interesting solid implementation. <laughs> so <clears throat> it's nice because they improve on a lot of the things that GBDE does not uh, really solve entirely. Um, again, though, it has the same issue with mounting the root file system where you can't have a key file, you have to have a passphrase. And correct me if I'm wrong, if, if that's the case, but. Um, uh, it does allow for a key file when you're not mounting the root file system. So it does solve this major problem where you can't really abstract the key from the user very easily. Um, and as a result, it's a little bit better than GBDE. CryptoLoop is a pile of shit, and you should not use it. I couldn't be more blunt about that. It's terrible. You shouldn't use it. Shame on the people that wrote it. They didn't read applied cryptography, and they didn't ask anybody what they're doing or something. I don't know, but for a very long time there have been a lot of known issues with this thing, and uh, the guy that wrote Loop AES uh, rips into these people all the time, which maybe he does a little bit too much, but I think he's probably just pissed that they uh, somehow ended up in the mainline kernel. Uh, I, and he did not, and well, it has problems. So anyway, um, you could build rainbow tables and attack the uh, crypto loop implementation, which is uh, not a good thing. You wouldn't want that. Um, but it's open source, so you can see how poorly it's done. So uh, dmcrypt apparently has the same on-disk format as CryptoLoop. I don't know why they would advertise that as a feature. Um, I'm not, I haven't looked at the code for uh, dmcrypt, and I, just, just that the, in, the initial claim that they have anything in common with CryptoLoop just makes baby Jesus cry. It's, frankly, it's just, it's terrible. I wouldn't, I don't know. I, I wouldn't, I'm not interested in it. But I have seen implementations where people have set up GPG and they've set up um, a key file and they have it split and all this stuff. It makes me, I mean, you'd be, again, you'd be limited to how secure your random passwords are and whether or not the, uh, the uh, swap is encrypted correctly and whether or not the actual data gets paged out to disk. So again, this is somehow the new standard for Linux disk crypto and I'm not sure why. Um, maybe there's some strengths that I'm missing, um, but I don't particularly trust this implementation yet. Maybe in a little while, when more people have taken a look at it, maybe when some real crypto cryptographers have actually like gone the full mile and analyzed it. Um, so I'm sort of involved, but not really, with Loop AES. In that, once I said I was going to make the Loop AES website, and then I never got around to doing it because I hate w making websites. Um, it has multiple modes, which are really nice. The first mode was very similar to the uh, crypto loop um, kernel I stuff, which is basically just a passphrase. 
that was quickly dropped in favor of uh, multi-key um, version one and two. And the multi-key modes allow you to have a ridiculously long 64 randomly generated keys of variable length that are then iterated through n number of AES uh, 256 uh, or whatever you want. Um, you can have any ha hashing algorithm you like. And so you get some pretty random keys. And the user is not really the weak point if you can keep your, uh, your GBG key, which encrypts this key file, out of the hands of, say, the police. Um, Multi-key mode version three improves on this again, but adds like a, a 65th key to protect against a particular threat. Uh, it has issues where the whole system can hard lock if you use the journal, uh, journaling file system on a file back loop or uh, really any file system on a big enough file back loop can lock it up. So just don't do that. Use a partition back loop. Um, I'm assuming, of course, that you're familiar with how to create some of these different uh, disk crypto uh, setups. If you're not, there's a, probably some, it's a good idea to read some introductions on the topic. So um, you have the ability for key abstraction and salting. You have your choice of hashes and your choice in ciphers. Um, one thing that's nice about Loop AES is that it's actually implemented in Assembler, so it's pretty fast. It's probably the fastest AES implementation on Linux if you're doing this Discrypto stuff. So uh, if you look at Bonnie, uh, uh, if you look at Bonnie uh, setups for this and testing how fast it writes, you have significant overhead. It's not particularly fast, and your system actually will run pretty dog slow, but it, it's it's not so much um, that it's unusable, but it's certainly not um, just a normal unencrypted file system. Um, however, it's not stock in the mainline Linux kernel, which is, I don't know, that's kind of crappy. I think a lot of people don't want to use it for that reason alone. Um, if you're using something like Debian or Ubuntu, it's as, as simple as just installing the loop AES uh, um, patched uh, util Linux and uh, the uh, module, but at the same time, if you want to just have a disk, uh, uh, like a USB disk with you that you wear around your neck and plug it into any Linux box and have it work, Loop AES is not really the solution for you because it's not really adopted by every vendor and, and built into every, uh, every distro that you're going to use. Um, and it's open source, so you can take a look at it. It shares a lot of code with other, uh, other people's projects, and it's, it's I think it's pretty well done. It's what I use um, and have been using for a long, long, long time. Um, and because of the way that you have this key abstraction with, say, GBG, it's native. Um, when it goes, when you boot up, it'll ask you, um, you know, Mount will ask you for your passphrase. Mount hands it off to GPG. GPG decrypts your key file and in memory c gets those keys over to Mount. And then Mount, of course, mounts the disk and those are stored. Uh, stored in the kernel, and then you have your encrypted swap, and in theory, through so many layers of complexity, uh, you have kept the user from compromising his data directly, especially if you can keep this uh, GBG key and your key file out of the hands of the police and regularly change that passphrase and hope that no one has shoulder surfed in between uh, possibly imaging that key. So. <laughs> This is the point in the presentation wherein we laugh at Apple. <coughs> Are there any Apple engineers in the house? Raise your hand. Come on. <laughs> Don't be afraid. OK. So I think uh, the, probably a lot of the Apple engineers are really smart guys uh, and girls, and girls and guys, whatever. Um, I'm, I'm sure of it. There's no doubt about it. Um, I talked to an Apple security representative um, about uh, how their file system worked and if they could give me some documentation on it so that I could evaluate it for multi-thousand user site and I was interested in, you know, you know corporate CEO laptops and, uh, you know, important data security and all this and they didn't give me anything. Um, so I'm not really particularly interested in trusting that kind of implementation where my data is uh, hidden through some sort of security through obscurity. And as it just so happens, the reason they don't give that information out, in, at least in my opinion, is because um, it's nonsense. Um, so according to Apple, at home in a way, keep your valuable documents safe with powerful AES-128 encryption. 
FileVault automatically encrypts and decrypts everything, blah, blah, blah. Real security comes from nobody knowing. Yes, excellent. Nobody can do it without your permission. Your trade secret stays secret. And then it talks about how long the universe has been around and a bunch of other crap that you just know is just a totally, it's like, look over here, everybody. We're secure. Excellent. So, file fault. <laughs> <coughs> All right. So it, it supports a few of our requirements. In theory, you have a master password, um, so you can set this up in case your users forget their password. Well, that's great, because that means that you, like, as an administrator, if you set the system up, you can social engineer your users into thinking they've got an encrypted disk, and then you can recover their data later when they're not looking. Um, which means that if there was a way to compromise the actual system beforehand, you could possibly set up master passphrases without the users ever knowing. So if you could, you know, get into one of these boxes and mess with things, you could probably have a lot of fun. Um, another thing is that you can't, as far as I understand it, um, boot OS X without um, having some part of your system, a major part of your system, completely unencrypted, which means that you can still compromise the binaries. And due to the way that a lot of uh, the awesomeness of OS X comes out, you have like stuff like pre-binding where you can't really uh, know what the checksums of the binaries are going to be unless you have specific tools that are built for that, um, which means that like if someone were to own your box, you probably don't know it, which is really bad. And well, that's too bad for you. So, <clears throat> so you don't have the source code for the whole system because Apple doesn't open source every, every step of the way. You can't see from the point where you enter your passphrase until it's decrypted. So you just have to trust that Apple did it right. So they don't. So here's an example that everybody here probably knows about if you've ever read Bug Track, which is that in var vm swap file, you can grep it and pull your passphrase out unhashed. Just the straight passphrase. You can find lists of files. You can find your encrypted container names and passwords and everything. <laughs> everything. So even if they de deleted their, de their, their encrypted partition, if they didn't remove their swap file, you can get all the contents of their disk. So if they had some files that were named something that sounds incriminating, you've just, you've just locked yourself up and thrown away the key. Which is great, because Apple never throws away your key. <laughs> so, Supposedly, 10.4 allows for encrypted swap, and the machine starts to run even slower than before, um, and that's great. So they encrypt the swap. So the question is, how do they take your passphrase and actually tie that into the disk? And if anybody here knows, I'd like to I'd like to hear about that because it doesn't sound like they've done a very good job of that. Although it is nice that they uh, encrypt the swap now. So at least the forensics labs that were um, breaking uh, supposed criminals' disks using this method, they're going to have at least a little bit harder time. They might actually have to hire a cryptographer to attack the actual data that's on the disk. Um, though I'm not sure. Uh, I haven't spent very much time um, trying to attack 10.4. So there's some other implementations. Um, Matt Blaze totally paved the way with CFS, which was an implementation of a user land NFS server. And it was pretty well done, um, but it's slow, because it's all in user space. Um, so you have DES, triple DES, Blowfish, and so on. Um, TCFS, um, very similar to the work by Matt Blaze. Um, it had some interesting ideas, but it has basically no key management, and it's just overall not so great. Although both of these are nice in that it allows you to do uh, per user encryption. So, Rubberhose file system. In today's world, this is probably going to get you killed, and it's not a good idea to use it, in my opinion. Um, when I talk with human rights or environmental activists about using Discrypto, I try to advise against them using this because I don't think that it's a good idea to never be able to prove that you can't decrypt your data and that you may have a secret. Because if someone wants to beat you or kill you or whatever they want to do, they're going to do it. A rational attacker is going to eventually kill you anyway. So to not be able to decrypt your data, it seems like a pretty bad idea. Although some people might argue that the threat model is not so realistic and it's nice to have the ability to give up some data so that you can have something to bargain with, I think that um, you're screwed either way and this is just a false sense of security. Though it was a nice idea. So I'm not really interested in other commercial software after seeing how badly Apple did it. I'm 
not interested in seeing how badly other people do it. So again, NetBSD, OpenBSD, FreeBSD, Loop AES and Linux, these are really good. They have some problems, but compared to Apple, <laughs> and <laughs> there's no problems <laughs> at all. I mean, the, the, the threat model is different. It's like, uh, what, what's the line from applied cryptography? There, there are two, time, uh, two types of security, the type that keeps out your kid's sister and, and the type that keeps out world governments. Well, like, your kid's sister could stumble across your password with security designed by Apple. So, it's like not, so uh, not such a great implementation. So, you need to choose wisely about what your threat model is. If you're worried about the maid coming in and uh, doing uh, diffs on your drive image, you're probably in trouble with most of these. Because, for example, um, I don't think uh, any implementation other than NetBSD actually verifies any of the data when it's decrypting it. So that could be a vector of attack. Uh, I'm not totally sure if NetBSD does that, though, now that I think about it. Um, I know that, uh, for example, the crypto API stuff, the uh, crypto loop and the kernel i stuff, it doesn't do that. So that could be bad. Um, so I came up with an idea that is, I don't really like my idea. So I'm gonna, I'll tell you about my idea, but it has problems. So it's an idea that if you actually could come up with the right disk uh, encryption solution for you, uh, say loop AES in this example, um, then you can take the strength of loop AES and you can work around the fact that the internet is, is global and that police officers are part of a lazy bureaucratic system that even when it's in full motion, still is going to have trouble getting officers to Tuvala and to Syria and to Germany and to the UK all at the same time. Uh, and depending on how long the forensics labs are backed up, it's possible that by the time they get all these police officers together to try and decrypt your data, then it doesn't matter anyway because the time frame has passed, which I'll explain in a moment. So the idea here is that you've been arrested and your data has been taken and you're sitting in jail. So assuming that you have the right to remain silent, this, this system should at least slightly protect you. So in the UK and in civil court, you're forced to give up your passphrase or you would be forced to give up your passphrase if they decided that it was important enough. So that's really bad and that's, that's a problem. So, made mutually assured information destruction. It's basically the opposite of the rubber hose file system, where the rubber hose file system has unlimited layers and possibly as many uh, passwords as you'd like. This is one set of passwords, and it's you can prove that you can decrypt it. Um, and since made is basically just an idea, it's not it's not a specific implementation because I think that you should use it with NetBSD. You need to build your own infrastructure. You need to have servers in remote countries. You need to figure out if you want to split your key between multiple places. There's all sorts of things. But the basic idea is this. You have an encrypted container, your device or your files. You have an authentication token, for example, an SSH key. Um, this is where your authentication token is the most important part as far as complying with the law. Because this is the place where you have a passphrase and you type it in and it decrypts and you can show that it's decrypted. It says like, yes, this is the passphrase you've, you've entered. Okay, now you're authorized to perform services on the remote server. So then you have an encrypted key list or key lists. In the case of Loop AS, if you have 65 keys, you could very easily take any number of those 65 keys and split them up amongst any number of different servers and any number of pass passphrases and you can add a bunch of complexity that might end up landing you in jail longer, I don't know. So um, then you need a network to provide a connection. So you want to make sure that you tunnel your traffic because assuming that you're under watch, you probably are being monitored. You're probably having your traffic analyzed. You could probably use something like Tor, although I've heard that Tor has some problems. I think the guy that wrote it, Roger Dingledine, is an extremely smart guy. And as a result, if I was going to tunnel over any publicly accessible uh, network, like onion routing network, that would probably be the one. JAP, the Java anonymous proxy, being basically one and the same. Um, so in this case, you need to connect to this remote server. And this is really the, the weakest link in the whole system because if you're not running the server, you, you probably don't know if they make backups. 
you don't know what their administrators are doing, if they comply with the law, if they live in a country where they can't even tell you if they're complying with the law, as is the case in the UK, as is the, in the case in the United States. But you really would probably want to choose your system based on uh, whether or not it's safe. So countries that are hostile with your country are probably a good start. Um, so anyway, then you need to figure out a threshold of time, which is the amount of time that you can remain silent either while they're ripping your toenails out or while you're just sitting in jail watching television. So you put it all together and you authenticate, and you type in your passphrase for your SSH key, you connect to the server. If your threshold hasn't been reached, you're, you're allowed in. You send your key for decryption over an encrypted tunnel, and of course that is also tunneled so people don't know exactly where it is that you're connecting to so that they can't go and seize that server before your threshold is up. Um, you send your key file for decryption, and the return data is never seen by the user, but the device is mounted. So this is pretty easy to do with Loop AES because it basically already does this. Um, when you log with mount, it just pipes to the GPG, and again, so it's very simple to construct these things because every, every bit of it can be tied together easily. However, if the threshold is passed, then your decrypting service is revoked, and it returns a message like, I'm sorry, but your keys have been destroyed which could be very useful when someone wants to prove that you've given the passphrase to the police, and at the same time, the server is the thing denying access. You are not obstructing justice anymore. Justice was just too slow to catch you. And in this case, it was too slow to catch your keys. And that's not your fault because you just remained silent, which is your right. You have the right to remain silent, so you just didn't incriminate yourself. So. What this, of course, uh, adds to the threat model is that you're going to have to worry about <laughs> school for the gifted. Oh. School for the gifted. So, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> it's an uber elite hacksaw conference. So, all right. So, here's the problem, though. Um, you can't exonerate yourself anymore. You can't. You can't say yes, your honor. Here is all of my data. There's no question. Let's build mutual trust. So if you're using a system like this, you have to be willing to be a test case for it. And the reason I didn't write this yet is because I'm not really that interested in being responsible for sending you to jail. So it wouldn't be too hard to write it. It's really, really just simple. But you also have to worry about the fact that your, uh, your server uh, could easily compromise you. It's this really bad single point of failure. So if you split the key up in multiple countries, it might be expensive, um, but it might save you. So I called it made because it cleans up after you when you're not around. So I thought that was really clever. <laughs> I bet you do too. Awesome. So assuming you don't screw up the implementation and you live in a free country and uh, you're not the, the test case that goes to jail because uh, Guantanamo Bay is pretty cold this time of year. Um, it could be nice for you. Um, but again, you, you can now prove that you are unable to decrypt your data. You can say, I comply with the law, Your Honor. Here is my encrypted data. Here are my keys. Here are my passphrases. Here are my authentication tokens. Oh, and by the way, here's the IP for the server. So, well, it's perhaps not in the spirit of the law where they get your data. It does seem to comply with the letter of the law. And I did check with some lawyers in the United States, and they said, well, you know, Jake, that's a really awesome idea, but there's no way I would trust my data to that. I said, well, make backups. And they said, well, what about the backups? I mean, what if they seize the backups? So, of course, if you make backups, like everybody here does, then you have another problem. But if you take a page from Adrian Lamo's backpack falling into a river, if they don't have your backups, you're probably going to be all right in that you just, they don't have any evidence against you. And the evidence that they do have is something that, uh, you can show them that you can't compromise even though you can fully comply. So unless your containers implementation is broken, you should be, I'm not sure what the rest of that slide says. So, <laughs> added value. Excellent. So here's what's wrong with MADE, everything. It's, it's just an idea. It's only, the only reason it even exists is because we live in a time where our governments are increasingly trying to pry into our private lives and are increasingly treating everybody like criminals which essentially they make everybody into criminals. Um, so it's tied to a network. Um, so let's say your threshold is 15 days. So that means every 15 days you have to mount your drive and connect 
Um, so if you have like an uptime of 300 days, hope you don't turn that system off unless you've uh, recently connected. So it's tied to the network. Um, so if your network goes down and you really uh, say you're in the middle of a disaster zone or something like this, I don't know why you'd be there, but if you were and you can't get online, you might never, you might never be able to get your data back. So <clears throat> again, the server is a single point of failure, so split the key up. Um, and if the server makes backups, um, you could very easily have your key on tape somewhere which could then, well, get you. So it's brittle. So take the basic ideas from MAID and hopefully some of you will also take some of the other ideas from the slides and really go and make some improvements on some software but also just think about things a little bit differently. So if you're encrypting your home partition and that's it, you might want to th also think about all the other places you're leaking data. Not, of course, there's also the fact that you're leaking data to the network but that's another story. Um, an interesting uh, legal quandary is that if you know that you're being watched in the United States by the FBI and you change your threshold right before they kick down your door, you could possibly end up in jail for the crime of obstructing justice, I believe, which that's probably not such a good idea. So hopefully they haven't figured out that you've changed your threshold or hopefully you have a reasonable threshold and you can remain silent and America will remain free. Come on now, that was a joke. So <clears throat> don't give up hope. Open source your implementation because free software makes it a lot easier to analyze this and it also means that more people will use it. But again, you have lots of issues. This doesn't address things like, you know, another user rooting your box while the partition is mounted and if you're connected to the internet, someone being able to do other nasty things to you. So thanks to Daniel Berg and Christian Fromm and other awesome German hackers that I've met here at the CCC for advising me as well as giving me caffeine last night. Uh, and uh, yeah, so if you need to contact me, my first name at mylastname.net, uh, pretty easy. You can just look me up. So uh, I don't know how much time we have left. Wait, two minutes, I guess. <laughs> so um, if anyone has any questions, it's probably better that we do them after the talk, but maybe we could do a couple now. Ah, voila. Uh, I was uh, just uh, thinking, a uh, good excuse uh, uh, for using MAID uh, is that uh, you would want uh, the data to, to disappear uh, after you die. Uh, so uh, uh, that would be a good uh, official excuse. <clears throat> but um, um, my main question was um, multiple times uh, uh, through the talk, uh, uh, you hinted at uh, per user encryption of home uh, directories and you said that <clears throat> uh, one of the bad things in the Apple implementation was that uh, the um, system administrator uh, uh, had a way to, to recover passphrases, but I mean, if the user is using a computer, can't root, uh, get to, to the key anyway, uh, uh, with any system. Yeah, absolutely, and if you're using a system like this, you, you end up where, at least uh, for my understanding of legal theory, is that you're going to end up where the system administrator is going to be the one that's going to have to compromise the data and that could compromise everybody on the system. But if you have per user file encryption, if each file is, uh, each partition, each different <coughs> container is encrypted, the system administrator can't give it up unless he can somehow give um, uh, an image of the memory at that exact moment when every single user is logged in. Oh, I see. Yeah. So it's not that the system administrator is working against you. It's the idea that if the police come and make the system administrator work against you, it would, it's not entirely easy for them to give it up. Whereas previously, for example, in Italy, um, one thing that had happened with indie media was that they, uh, the police had come and imaged the server and taken the SSL keys so they could read everybody's email in transit and they did this for an entire year and nobody knew about it. Um, so the police could do something like that but it wouldn't help them. They wouldn't have anything from the home directories other than the encrypted containers which is very nice. So that's, I mean, an added benefit. Does that answer your question? Yes. All right, excellent. Okay, this is not really um, a question, this is rather a commentary. I'm one of the Rubberhose authors, <laughs> so <laughs> since you've been bashing Rubberhose, um, 
rubber hose was incepted um, in 1997, so this was before the whole cl political climate somewhat changed. And we haven't been working on it since, I think, July 2000. Um, however, I fully stand behind the idea of deniable uh, encryption, and I still think it is a good idea. The question, however, is in what political environment you want to use that. Like, in Great Britain, I have no problem with using it, rather than Iraq or some hostile country where I can get into, really trouble, in, into real trouble for using it. But still, I think the, the cases where you get in trouble with using rubber hose, you will get into trouble with your system made as well. It will not allow you to stay alive, I think. Well, it's, it's true that you would probably be in just as much trouble, but the difference is that you would be able to say, I cannot decrypt anything more, whereas with rubber hose, they can continually... That's the whole point. Yeah, absolutely, but I don't think that that's a good idea. I think it's better well, to say that you can't decrypt it, but you will comply with them, whereas with, with rubber hose, it's the opposite. Well, it depends on whether you're egoistic and just care about your own life or whether you're within an organization and you care about the greater goal of that organization. It's a cultural question, I think. Sure, and I think both, both things have their place, but I don't think rubber ho hose is so much a place in the future. But maybe, maybe we can have a better discussion about this offline. Okay. Um, I have a question. Uh, would it be better to have the... Um, Keys from Loop AIS, for example, I use it because I think it's fine. Um, distributed on a network, so you, um, so so if they steal your machines, they, they you don't have the keys and they do not have them also, and you have to authenticate against the network, and the network just um, ha have uh, stores them on some secure servers, for example, and so you have a backup of your keys, and um, I think this would be a fine solution. Maybe it would, could could be combined with your mate idea. I think that that could be a good idea, but then you have basically the same problem that MAID has, which is that the servers around could compromise you. But you has, have one advantage, because if you have your machine and it always wants, uh, checks if the servers are available on the IP and with the certificate that is known, if you put the machine in some other environment, um, the server can say, okay, the machine has the wrong IP address, I will destroy the keys, for example. I think that that's a good idea. Thank you. There's, there's someone up in front that needs a microphone. It's usual um, symmetric ciphers, but it's possible with um, one time pad. You can have two keys, the real one, and the other one decrypts your data to something. Um, not making you trouble against the law. So it decrypts your home drive to a virgin skeleton home directory or something. This, this idea um, has not the problem to authenticate networks and so on and trust administrators who uh, contain servers or something. I think um, that solution is basically one of the things that the rubber hose file system did. Right? The ability to have multiple passphrases which will decrypt different types of partitions. which. It is a good idea for certain people. I just, I personally wouldn't want to use it. And when I've been in places where I thought my data was going to be examined, such as when I went to Iraq, I didn't bother with the rubber hose file system. In fact, I knew that there were pretty much two cases. Um, yeah, I knew that there were pretty much two cases where you would either have a forensics lab or you would not have a forensics lab. You would just have someone sneaking around asking you to log into your machine. So. Since, any other questions? Awesome. Thanks. <laughs>